Welcome back to OTP. Welcome back to the 2029 draft where we will be picking 14th, which has a slot value just north of $6 million. Let's see who we're going to pick. Here's how the draft has looked so far. A lot of Joe, Josh, Joey, and Mike uh, so far in this draft with one Genjo. Uh, but Joe Hayes, a shortstop out of the University of West Florida, was your number one overall pick for the Kansas City Royals, nicknamed Lobster. First round here, and I'm just kind of at a loss as to who to pick. These guys up top right here, the five-star potentials, their demand is too high. We're not going to be able to sign them for that kind of money. But there are some uh, intriguing high school arms. I like Mike Drake, who has high work ethic. He's a ground ball pitcher with 60 stuff potential. I like the 65 home run allowed potential with excellent control. Maybe not the greatest of repertoires, maybe not the greatest of stuff. There are stuffier high school arms in this draft. But then on the college end of the spectrum, I'm also enamored with Daniel Arana, who uh, has just insane defensive ratings and some power, maybe not the greatest contact potential, uh, and doesn't quite have the personality traits we're looking for, although that's kind of offset by the fact that he is a college bat, so lower variance there. And then Devon Bowie's a guy who I really coveted. Coming out of high school, he's now coming out of college and uh, still looks really good. I'm trying to decide, considering he has work, high work ethic, whether it is better to pick him because he's a little bit safer or go with the high school arm or go with the shortstop. Yeah, after a ton, and I mean a ton of wavering back and forth, I think I'm going to go with Daniel Arana. He doesn't have that high work ethic or high intelligence that I'm normally looking for, especially in the first round. But you just don't see this combination of infield ratings and potential power and eye. You just don't see it that often. I think it's really special. I like that he bats lefty. I'm excited for him. I like that he, you know, is already a, a one and a half star. He could be, you know, playable in maybe double A right away. I'm going to go with Daniel Arana here. It just feels like the right pick. I like that his demand is also five million, which is a little bit below slot. Second round here, much easier pick for us, and that's going to be Mike Drake. We talked about picking in the first round. Probably much better to pick the high-variance high school arm in the second round than in the first round. I'm, I'm much more comfortable with that outcome. It says his demand is slot here, but I guess he was expecting to be a first-round pick. Our recommended slot value for the second-round pick is just $1.7 million. His demand is 2.6. We've kind of talked about you know issues with the draft budget and offering over slot at times, but I'm just going to go ahead and draft this player and try to see how I can finagle the money to sign him. Third round here, we're going to pick a high schooler again, this time a bat by the name of David Thibodeau. Not the greatest defensive ratings, wouldn't be the greatest in either corner outfield spot, but great contact potential, great power potential, good eye potential. This is a guy who can seriously rake, so uh, we're going to go with David Thibodeau for our third round pick. Fourth round here, we're going to draft another high school arm in the form of Jimmy Luman. He has 80 stuff potential. I know that he doesn't really have the good personality traits. I know that the movement and control are nothing to write home about and that he's probably never going to reach the stuff potential eventually. But look, if he gets close to that 80 and we convert him to a reliever, I think things could definitely work out well. I like that he has five different pitches. High upside here, a ton of variance. But in the fourth round, I am comfortable with that. We will draft the player known as Jimmy Luman. And in the fifth round here, I will pick Mauricio Albaran. He is a college hitter out of the University of Arkansas. Good defensive ratings at shortstop. Looks like he could be a league average-ish hitter if he fully develops. And I like the high work ethic, good personality traits across the board for Mauricio Albaran, who will be our fifth round pick. I will now finish the rest of the draft off screen and get to work signing these guys. So the way to do these negotiations, and admittedly it's kind of a cheesy way to do these negotiations, but I think the smart thing to do is offer Mike Drake his demand because he's the one guy who demands over slot with the exception of Alberon, but that's only a difference of 5,000, so I think it's pretty negligible at that point. So if I offer Mike Drake his demand, he takes it, he signs with us, and then no matter what, no matter if your budget is zero, the game will still let you offer slot value. So then I can just offer slot value for everybody else once Mike Drake accepts his above slot offer. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go ahead and meet the demand or on Mike Drake, which is 2.6 million, and then I will move on and do the slot for everyone else once Mike Drake accepts. So we are here at the All-Star break. We are 44 and 54, and this is just kind of a team of contrasts. We're seven games off of first place Seattle. 
We are fourth in home runs, yet 14th in OPS. So we're home runs, but not much else. And then as far as the pitching goes, our bullpen ERA is the best in the league, and our starters ERA is almost the worst in the league. So it's just kind of an interesting sort of uh, dynamic for this team so far. And we have played better since that awful, awful start we had. And yet it's tough to see us in contention with two weeks to go to the trade deadline. But we'll just have to see. Maybe we'll get hot. Mike Drake, our second round pick, has indeed accepted our offer to sign for over slot. That means everyone else in the top five can be signed at slot value. Here are your all-star rosters for 2029, and I'll admit my heart kind of sank when I saw some of these names because Parker Detmers is the Angels all-star this year. The Angels are the worst team in our division, but he will be representing the Angels in the all-star game, and we just traded him this past offseason. If we look at this trade... It was for Somei Shimizu, who has the exact same ERA and is a lot older, and we're paying him a lot more money to basically be as good as Parker Detmers. So kind of an unfortunate outcome on our part right there. Mason Miller, also an all-star back in his relief role where he is absolutely killing it. So good for him, although not a starter for the Royals anymore. Uh, Ronan Kopp is an all-star for us. Uh, that is his second consecutive all-star game. Guy's a beast, and this is an especially impressive performance for him because he did kind of have a slow start to the year. But actually, in terms of his peripherals, like look at his uh, you know, ratios and strikeouts, walks and home runs, doing better than he has uh, the previous year. Could he be trade bait? Ooh, I wonder. I wonder. Uh, Vinny Pasquantino, also an all-star. Uh, I like to see that as well. Vin Pasquantino, this has definitely been his best year for us. Our trusty leadoff hitter doing big things for us as well. It looks like the American League, the top players overall are Wyatt Langford, who's having another monster year, as well as Jackson Holiday, who's pacing for almost a 10-war season. I guess those two would be considered the front runners for the MVP award. In the National League, here are your uh, all-stars. It appears uh, the top guys include Jackson Churio, although it does say he's injured. I think he's probably all right. Uh, Michael Harris having a monster year as well. You'll recall that Churio is the uh, reigning MVP. And then uh, Acuna is having a big year as well as Ellie De La Cruz. Ellie De La Cruz pacing for another nine-war season, looking for potentially his second MVP award. Going into the second half, the rest of my draft picks are indeed signing on, so that method appears to have worked. July 23rd, we are 46 and 56. We got all our draft picks signed, and it's just a matter of waiting the week until the trade deadline to figure out what direction we want to take things. All right, I've simmed ahead a week. We are now 50 and 57. We are seven and a half games out of the division and 11 and a half out of the wild card. So the division is quite weak, and I hope the division continues to be that way because that might be our best route into the playoffs someday. But as of right now, I'm going to make the decision that for the most part, this will be a selling deadline for us. I don't know exactly who I'm going to sell on. It could be Ronan Kopp. That would be sort of the really interesting one because he's getting up there with the ARB money. He's been one of the best relievers in baseball, you know, over the last few years. But we also do have the best bullpen ERA. So that could be an opportunity for us to improve by trading him for a starter or a everyday position player. But I'm just going to have to explore that. I'm not really sure what trades I'm going to come up with, but I know I can come up with up to three, which is one higher than it used to be. Well, here is the first of up to three trades of our trade deadline, and it's going to involve Joey Ortiz, who has been on our team for a while. I just don't think I realize he's been on our team for that long. 381 games, 85 OPS plus, 6 war because the defense in the infield is very, very good. He's 80 grade at second base thanks to his 75 infield range, but never really hit all that well for us. His best year was definitely 2027. And uh, his free agency is rapidly approaching. He basically has two months left on his deal. And I don't think he's a guy we would necessarily bring back. So best to trade him now alongside Devin Taylor, who has, uh, you know, no future on this team. We've kind of established that. In return, we will get Jacob Reimer, who I'm excited about, Jacob Reimer. Jacob Reimer with that 70i, he's already been a two-war player for Philadelphia this year. So he's already proven he can perform at the big league level. He can play anywhere, basically, if you look at his ratings. He, you wouldn't play him at center field or shortstop, but basically anywhere else, I think he'd be fine. So that's kind of exciting as well. He expects to be in the starting lineup. I think we'll find creative ways to make that happen. And uh, again, this is a guy who's already proven he can perform, and he only has two plus years of service time. You know, he hasn't hit his arb yet. So, uh, you know, this is a guy who has more years than Joey Ortiz. We will also get Jesus Miranda, 
a Dominican pitcher with high work ethic and uh, some decent potential ratings across the board. Maybe not the greatest uh, repertoire we've seen, but the, the 65, up to 65 home runs allowed, that's exciting. And I like that he's only just 16 years old. He was born in 2013 in this universe. Uh, I also like that he is already pitching in rookie ball and somehow not absolutely terrible, like not a miserable pitcher. So that's pretty impressive at age 16. Uh, so I'm happy to make this trade. Uh, we will be saying goodbye to Joey Ortiz and Devin Taylor, but we will be moving on with our future. And a big goal of this deadline is the budget space right here. As you can see, we are very much in the red, and we're trying to get ourselves in a better position going into the offseason. So let's go ahead and make this trade. The second trade we're going to make is the end of an era. The J.P. Sears era, he's been with us all throughout this save. He's the last remaining OG Oakland A in terms of players who were in the majors before we took over. And here are his final stats with us. Over 200 starts made as an Oakland A. You'll recall we gave him the extension. He was the first player we really gave a multi-year extension to in the first place, and that has run out. That will run out at the end of this season. He's now 33. He's probably not coming back. And truth be told, 2026 was the last particularly good year, but it is a bummer. We are now, you know, about five and a half seasons into this save, and uh, only now are we going to have a team that is fully ours, not not just players we've inherited, if that makes sense. We do still have guys who were part of the organization. One of those is Denzel Clark, who will also be trading, but even Brady Basso is in AAA right now and is still, you know, considered to be in the fold uh, one way or another. Uh, Denzel Clark... Uh, has also been basically with us from the start. He made his debut in 2024. He's been a 10-war player, a lot of that coming from his defense and base running. This year, though, replacement level, and that's no good because it, he's gotten up there in the ARB years, 6.5 million this year, probably 7 or 8 million next year. We just can't afford to pay that much money for, uh, you know, replacement level. And we will be retaining uh, some of J.P. Sears, but that's only for the rest of the year. So this is basically not 5 million being retained. I would say this is more like probably 2 million being retained, 1.5 million being retained. Uh, but it's just to get Colorado to agree with us on this deal. So Colorado is going to be our trade partner. We're going to get Landon Knack, who's been kind of consistently a two-war pitcher for them. He's going to take over Sears' spot in the rotation. I don't think he's amazing or anything. He, he himself is 32 years old, but we at least get a player with a little more team control than Sears. And uh, Jake Kadena is an interesting prospect to me. I like the 60 outfield range. I think he'd be a great left fielder in particular. 55 contact potential and power potential. But the real thing for me is the high work ethic and the high intelligence. With those positive personality traits, if he hits a little bit of talent change randomness, he could be a, a good outfielder. But a long way to go. He's only 19 years old. So that's a trade we're going to make. It definitely is going to uh, you know, free up some salary for us because these are two of the highest paid players on the team. And we'll see how we're able to use that money going into the offseason. As you have probably guessed, that trade of Denzel Clark signals the beginning of the Chris Baker era in center field for us. This is the prospect I've been very excited, our 2027 first rounder, and probably the drafty that I've developed the most in terms of just having a player that I'm pretty sure is going to be a good everyday player for us. He may not be a superstar, but I think he's going to be a very good player indeed, especially if he can continue to develop and in AAA, he hasn't done particularly well. If he had done better in AAA, I think he would have been up sooner. I think he could have been up in May if he had a hot start in AAA. But what's exciting is the idea that if he reaches all of these ratings or close to it, I think he's going to be a very good player indeed. And it's possible that, that development is best done in the majors for him now. So uh, we're going to insert him. He'll be playing center field and batting eighth for us. Jacob Reimer, who we traded for, will be playing second base for us for the time being at least. I went ahead and simulated forward another day to July 30th, which is the trade deadline. Those two trades were made the day before the deadline, and we won 6 to nothing, which is nice. But the really exciting news, how about a home run for Chris Baker in his Major League debut? Hopefully the first of many. And that means it's time for our third and final trade of this deadline. It is not going to involve Ronan Kopp. I know that I have been tempted to trade Ronan Kopp at times, but every time I've shopped him around, I've been underwhelmed with the level of interest from other teams. I basically think they are lowballing me. He is sort of Mason Miller-esque in terms of what he can do. We're using him in this stopper role where he's you know throwing you know 80, 90, up to 100 innings per year, and he's been brilliant, and he really affects wins and losses for us. 
he would like to be in the starting rotation at times. I understand that. And we're going to have to kind of make that same decision as we did with Mason Miller. Eventually, we traded Mason Miller for Vinny Pasquantino. I have not been getting any sort of, you know, Vinny Pasquantino offers in return for Ronan Kopp. So no Ronan Kopp trade this time along. It's going to be Spencer Torkelson, who has a team option coming up. And I just have no idea what I would do with it, to be honest with you, because he has excellent ratings across the board. And yet, he hasn't done much for us hitting-wise besides hit home runs. He's pacing for 29 homers. That's fine. It's just the fact that he's, you know, 94 OPS plus replacement level. That's not doing it for me. Jose Soriano was always kind of a mercenary. We traded for him uh, with St. Louis at the beginning of this offseason in exchange for Joe Stanley, a starting pitching prospect. And honestly, in terms of ERA, he's been one of our worst relievers, actually. Our bullpen's just been so good, and he's actually been one of the weaker links in that bullpen. So we're going to trade him for Hurston Waldreb, who I think will slot right into that bullpen and will be another good, you know, stopper option. And I think will be very comparable to Soriano, albeit, you know, uh, younger and with more team control anyways. And Vance Honeycutt. Vance Honeycutt was a guy I liked a lot coming out of the draft. He was a seventh overall pick, signed for $10 million with St. Louis, has been on a bit of an odyssey since. He's barely played in the big leagues, but 75 outfield range is 75 outfield range. That is good, you know, fourth or fifth outfielder uh, type of uh, quality to have. He's defense first for sure, but he has good organizational depth, and we're going to clear up some cash with this trade, and that's definitely been the goal of this offseason, and so it'll definitely be a new look for us for these last two months of 2029. Let's complete this trade. Here is what our new look team is going to look like post-trade deadline. We have sent down Kevin Bazell. This is mostly for roster construction reasons. He hasn't been particularly good for us at the big league level, although he's barely played. That's only 62 plate appearances. We have brought up Eric Ackerman in return, mostly because since trading Joey Ortiz, we've needed someone who's capable of playing both middle infield positions. That is Eric Ackerman in this case. Jesus Guevara is injured, so he would have been the other option for that. So it's really just Ackerman at this point. We've also brought back up Nathan Martorella, because Nathan Martorella was absolutely tearing it up in AAA. Look at this slash line across 40 games, over 700 slugging. So we're going to bring him back up, and he's going to get another crack at being in this lineup after being absolutely terrible to start the season. So uh, thank you, Nathan Martorella. You should be actually, you know what, honestly, he should be thanking me. Uh, looking at this lineup right now, here's how I've got things set up. And what I may do is also send down Newell, or I guess I'd have to wave and DFA him and bring in uh, Honeycutt, who we just traded for. Not sure if I'll do that just yet. But here's the lineup. It's kind of a doozy. Melendez is going to move up to uh, second, at least against right-handed pitching, because Melendez, look at Melendez's numbers this year. Like, we have just, this has been an awesome deal for us. We got him from Indie Ball, and I should point out, he is the brother of MJ Melendez, of the Royals. So that's nice, too. I've never said that. Uh, Jace Young is going to move to second base whenever we're facing off against right-handed pitching uh, to make room for Kuve at third base, so Kuve goes back to being a full-time player. Uh, Kuve is uh, exciting because some of his potential ratings have come up quite a bit, and if we can just work on those avoid Ks, I think he'll be great. I really see him as sort of the replacement for Pasquantino, because Pasquantino has one year left on his deal after this. That's kind of how I see things going, uh, but we do love some Pasquantino as well. Martorell is going to DH... Uh, that's only against right-handed pitching. Uh, Reimer left field, Chris Baker center, Noah Miller shortstop. Against the lefties, we've got Judd Fabian still. Judd Fabian, I've just come to find, is a platoon bat. Great against the lefties, not so great against the righties. Cuvay at first base in that scenario. Reimer at uh, second base and Young at third base in that scenario, although batting lower in the lineup than he normally would. We've got Chris Baker and Noah Miller in both of these lineups, so it should be interesting. It's kind of platoony. We've got guys moving around, but this is really the best lineup I could come up with given the situation the team is in right now. And then pitching-wise, it's not as interesting. Waldrop is going to replace uh, Jose Soriano, and Knack is going to replace J.P. Sears. But otherwise, things remain the same. As we roll over into August 1st now, it is time for another prospect check-in. We'll start with some good news. Good news from the Dominican Summer League, our lowest level. A couple of our big international signings are doing well. Alexis Calle, who he signed in 2028, he is doing well with a 311 average and 470 slug for a 121 OPS+. plus. This is his pro debut at age 19. And same for Juan Bustios, who is sort of our premier signing for 2029. Put all our budget into him. He is also doing quite well at this level. And I have a feeling Bustios, we will see him in full season A ball before we see Kaye. Uh, but they are roughly the same age. Um, some not so good news. We've kind of gone over the fact that uh, Pabon, who is part of this trade we had with the Dodgers, you know, isn't uh, as good ratings wise as he once appeared. That's perfectly fine. He's young. There's a lot of variance within that. Uh, Daniel Arana, I guess we should move on to. 
He's in high A 2029 first rounder. Only played eight games, but he has made his pro debut, so that is nice to see. We're excited about him. Uh, hopefully he can be up for us in the majors sooner rather than later, honestly. Chris Greer was also our 2026 first rounder, and uh, he has tried to make that transition from A to high A and has not gone so well. You, you can see he played with us uh, in A at the start of the year. That move to high A has not done well. So he'll finish it, he'll finish it uh high A, but you know, not maybe not the best looking draft pick for me, you know, a few years later. Speaking of first round draft picks, there's also Kevin Skeet in high A, 2028 first round draft pick, another guy whose ranks have come down uh, since we drafted him. His performance in high A has been fine. His performance as a pro honestly has been fine, but looking more like, you know, back end or middle of the rotation starter. We hoped we were getting a frontline starter. That's not looking like the case. Um, some more bad news just in the form of injuries. We have a fractured wrist on Mauricio Alboran. He was our fifth rounder this year. And Jesus Guevara, who I thought maybe would be in the big leagues by now, fractured only in his arm. That's why Ackerman is up. There is simply no competition in terms of getting a guy to play middle infield. Sergio Treviso, uh, to go back to A-ball, is someone who I'm excited about because he was doing quite well in the complex league, and that was his pro debut this year. We drafted him last year in the second round, and we've moved him up into full season A-ball, and that's where he'll finish out the year. But look at these ratings. This like looks like it could be a very nice player, like the high work ethic as well. So I'm excited about Sergio Treviso. That's a guy who I have kind of more on my radar now than I did a few months ago. Connor Griffin's in AAA, not exactly killing it. He'll finish in AAA. Chris Baker's, of course, in the majors. I guess the last guy to talk about would be Steve Young, who has moved up to AAA. He was doing very well in AA in 2029. Steve Young is our 2027 fifth rounder. In terms of catcher, I like his ratings, but at the same time, I like Jaden Melendez a lot. I'm not really sure if Steve Young should be a backup for us or if we should seek out another captain for that, in which case maybe Steve Young becomes trade fodder like we traded Brady Neal. I'm not sure, but I do like Steve Young. I do think he's a good catcher. I do think he could contribute to a big league team because look at these ratings if they come along and his decent enough defensive stats. Yeah, he could be a pretty good player. So uh, we'll keep an eye on Steve Young, just making it up to AAA. And finally, before we go trudging into August here, Frank Trejo is both your Pitcher of the Month and AL Rookie of the Month. Good for him. We can see that this has been a very good signing for us so far at only $2 million with the auto renew as well. I mean, we're going to have him on this team for a while, so that was a very nice signing on our behalf. And uh, you can see that he actually had a stinker here in the middle, seven earned runs versus the Phillies, but 10 and 12 strikeouts to start the month and to end the month, seven innings of shutout baseball. Way to go, Frank Trejo. September 1st, we are 62 and 72. I feel like we are often 62 and 72 on September 1st. I don't know if that's just me. Some guys have had trouble integrating into the lineup. Like Martorella was terrible and he's been a little bit better as of late, but uh, I don't really think he factors into our future all that much. I just think he's kind of here right now. Jacob Reimer has been a lot worse with us than he was with Philadelphia early this year. That's okay. He's still young. He's still 25. It's a, that was a long-term move on my part. Chris Baker, I must say, not too shabby so far. He's a 104 OPS plus. That means he's been an above average hitter. And I will say Connor Griffin doing better in AAA right now. And I'm just trying to imagine in the long term, oh, man, that Chris Baker, Connor Griffin, Josh Mears outfield, that could be a lot of fun next year. We'll see if that actually uh, comes into fruition. Frank Treo has slowed down since he was pitcher of the month, but I do want to shout out D.L. Hall. This has probably been his best year with us overall, pacing for 218 strikeouts. And so May Shimizu has done well as well. But as things stand, we are still 62 and 72, seven games off of first place. Uh, the Astros and Mariners are tied for first place in our division. It is also time for roster expansion. I ended up not sending down uh, Chris Newell, so I will bring up Vance Honeycutt uh, now in September as part of roster expansion, and I can add a pitcher as well. And that is going to be Brady Basso. Welcome back to the squad. September 5th, Nathan Martorella has a strained lat. That is a one-week injury. Just kind of a bummer for him because I think he was very slowly starting to figure things out, but we'll have to rearrange things a little bit here. We will start by putting Martorella on the 10-day injured list. And then I think we'll put Chris Newell in left field and kind of move everybody down the defensive spectrum. Reimer will be in a better position for him at second base. Young can play third base. Cuvé can play first base. Pasquantino will DH, and that's how we'll handle that. And I think I'll just call up Bazell for the time being. September 16th, we are 69 and 79. Martorella is indeed ready to come back, but the team just works so much better defensively without him in the fold. So I'm going to do something cheeky. I'm just going to set him to do a rehab assignment to the minors, and that's what he will do for the rest of the season, basically. 
September 22nd, we are 71-82. and 82. Once again, clinching the fact that we will not have a winning season. This team has not had a winning season since 2021. We took over in 2024, and that still remains our best season, at least in terms of wins and losses. With about 8 or 9 games remaining in the season, here's just a quick glance at the division races so far. The Rays, Red Sox, and Orioles are duking it out for the AL East. The Tigers and Twins are both going to the playoffs, but they don't know which one is going to go as the division winner and which as the wild card. The Astros have a one-game lead over the Mariners. Here's the wild card race right now. Minnesota's definitely going to grab one if they don't win the division. In the East, it's between the Braves and the Nationals. The Mets are a little bit on the outside looking in, but they still are only four games back. The Reds have 90 wins. The Arizona Diamondbacks have 89 wins. They're in commanding positions, although the Cardinals could certainly factor in. They look like they'll, at the minimum, grab a wild card spot. Two games left in the season here. We are 76 and 84. We will not make the playoffs once again, but we have helped eliminate the Seattle Mariners at least. It looks like the Astros will be grabbing the AL West title. We will go ahead and sim through these last couple games. We get a win in extras against Seattle as well. Eric Ackerman with a big RBI in the top of the 12th. And then one more game for us is also a win. So we'll finish at 78 and 84, a three-way tie for second place uh, in the AL West. Astros will win the West. The Tigers will win the Central with the Twins grabbing a very high-rated uh, wild card spot. 96 wins in the wild card. That stinks. Red Sox grab the AL East. And the Orioles and Rays will grab the other two wild card spots in the American League. Braves win the NL East, Nationals grab a wild card spot. Reds win the Central, Cardinals grab a wild card spot. And Diamondbacks win the West. They've been pretty strong throughout this save, and the Dodgers grab a wild card spot. Before we see who wins the playoffs, it's time for a quick team review. This was the best lineup we've constructed at the very least. It was kind of interesting. We didn't do the best in terms of average or on base, but we did slug some. We hit 206 home runs, which was tied for fourth in the American League, and we scored 700 runs, which is not something we've done. And honestly, if we can get the pitching and the defense a little bit better while scoring 700 runs, we could be in contention for a playoff spot, particularly in the weak AL West. We allowed 706 runs, so honestly, our run differential was only minus six. That's pretty good. We were still playing the best defense in the league. That's pretty good. But a big discrepancy between our starters ERA, which was 11th in the league, and our bullpen ERA, which was the best in the American League. The man leading that lineup, no doubt, was Josh Mears. A career year for him. Kept that strikeout total under 200. 42 home runs for Josh Mears. A wonderful year. And I really am just thinking about him and Chris Baker and Connor Griffin potentially in the same outfield next year. That could be a lot of fun. Jace Young was a slow starter for us, but actually finishing with 3.5 war and a 124 OPS plus, I am perfectly fine with that, especially considering we traded him for Jazz Chisholm. Look at what Jazz did. 60 games and then basically DFA negative one war so a great trade result for us there we will get chase young for another year as well although that will we will have to sort out his uh, arbitration pasquantino i think this was probably his best year for us as well uh, got him in the mason miller trade Jane Melendez was a very nice surprise, a 2.6 war catcher for us, mostly full-time. We'll see what we do at the catcher position. That should be interesting as well. Cuvée was a rookie this year, and he hit 26 home runs. If he works on that avoid case, he's going to be really good. I think he's just fine right now, but if he works on that avoid case, he can end up like Josh Mears and having a season like Josh Mears just had. That would be very exciting. Moving on to the pitching here, the rotation was not great, particularly at the back end, but D.L. Hall... Best year of his career so far, 215 strikeouts. And then uh, so so may Shimizu, who he traded for, and we still have under contract for two more years, although he is kind of old. He's 33 now. 3.83 uh, ERA in 195 innings. You definitely take that. It was just the back end of this rotation that had some trouble generally throughout the year. Landon Knack was not great for us post-trade. Eric Segura of the back end options was probably the most interesting, and he was a rookie 2026 second rounder who he brought up. So I don't know if he'll factor in the rotation next year, but uh, it was good to see. It was good to see. In long relief, we had Basso and Hogland, but I do want to talk about this bullpen in general because Ronan Kopp had another great year. It ended up being sort of similar to uh, his past years in terms of ERA, but with better peripherals, higher strikeout rate, higher walk rate, or sorry, lower walk rate, higher home run rate. Uh, added up to 3.2 F4, which was actually uh, leading the team, uh, if you'll uh, believe me. Spencer Eric Getty had a heck of a year, and he was also in that Mason Miller-Vinny Pasquantino trade from Kansas City. This was a wonderful year for Spencer Arigetti. 
uh, 13 saves, 84 innings, and an ERA under two, finishing hot as well. So I like that for him. I like Spencer Aragetti a lot, and I'm really glad he had this excellent season. I do also want to shout out Miguel Uyola. I'm working on that double L. Uyola uh, in his rookie year for us, essentially a 2.22 ERA. So a wonderful job by him. This was just a really good bullpen. I hope to be able to repeat the success of this bullpen in the years to come. So that's just a look at our team. It was probably our most interesting and and maybe our most sort of uh, inspiring hope type of team we've built so far. Even though we won 78 games and we've won 78 games before, the way we did it this time, it just kind of makes you think. Playoffs are underway. Dodgers and Braves have taken the first game of their respective wildcard series, and they will win those series. Meanwhile, the Rays and Twins take game one, and the Twins will advance. It will go to a game three between the Twins and, or sorry, between the Rays and Astros. And the Astros do advance, so this will be quite the Cinderella run if they can uh, get past Boston here. We are through to the best of five division series. Dodgers and Braves will take game one in the National League. And then let's see, the American League Twins and Astros. Okay, okay. Braves take a 2-0 lead over in the National League. And the Twins take a 2-0 lead, and the Red Sox tie up the series. Moving along here, we've got the Braves advancing. We've got a Game 5 here between the Dimebacks and the Dodgers, division rivals. We've got the Red Sox and Twins with the advantage 2-1. And the Red Sox will advance, so I think the better team does advance there. Going to go to a Game 5 here as well. Let's see. Diamondbacks win their game five, and Tigers win their game five. So it's going to be Tigers, Red Sox, Diamondbacks, Braves. Let's meet the final four teams remaining. So the Tigers were the best pitching team in the American League, but they have a lot of injuries. Most notably, out for one week is Caleb Lomavita, who is their star catcher. So that's tough to see. They're led offensively by Colt Keith and Max Clark, both of whom having excellent seasons. Here's Max Clark with a 6 war season. It's taken him a little bit to reach this level, but he's gotten there. And the rotation is just brilliant. Logan Allen, Jackson Job, Ty Madden, Casey Mize, all with ERAs well under 4. Red Sox are the names you would expect to see in this situation. A lot of young guys, and then Rafael Devers right there in the middle holding it down, although not as good a season this year as he had last year. Last year he had a wonderful season with an OPS uh, over 1,000. This year just a 3 war player, but still... Clearly the leader in the clubhouse. Oswald Peraza, that's an interesting player for them to have. And they are still led by their ace, Garrett Crochet. The Braves were one of our trade partners at the deadline. We'll check in on that in a second. But they are very injured right now. Acuna's out for a week, so he's not going to play in this series. Look at the season Acuna was having, though. My goodness. My goodness. Almost a 200 OPS plus 8 war in just 143 games. But this hamstring strain, that's a killer. And also uh, Max Freed injured, torn rotator cuff out six weeks. He won't play in the playoffs. And Volpe, who was their big trade acquisition, same thing. And he actually just had a very disappointing year for them in general. And they will have to pay out in the rest of that contract. So hopefully he bounces back for them. Otherwise, it's the Braves team you would expect. It's actually not that dissimilar from the Braves team you see now. There's Olsen, there's Riley, there's Harris, there's Albies. They do have Torkelson, who we traded to them, but uh, Torkelson not doing so good. So uh, I'm not minding that trade so far. And the rotation is interesting. They have, you know, Joe Ryan, but Joe Ryan has an ERA well over five this year and has, in fact, generally had an ERA over five. So uh, it's interesting to see. It's, it's a strong lineup for sure, even without Acuna, but the pitching without Freed, that's a tough, tough look. And injuries continue to be the trend because the Diamondbacks are going to have to go the next five days without Jordan Lawler. Maybe he can return in the middle of this series. We'll just have to see. Corbin Carroll looks great. A 3-4-5 slash 4.8 war for him on the season. Gabby Moreno is here. He really hits for average like crazy. Look at this. I mean, is this like three consecutive batting tiles for him? Unbelievable. Drew Jones is here as well. Good year for Drew Jones. Three war. Keep in mind, just the defense is absolutely insane. And they have this guy, Jose Caballero, who's not the Jose Caballero you're probably thinking of, the one that is currently on the Rays. But this guy has a 95i on the 20 to 80 scale and not much else. But uh, that leads to some pretty interesting slash lines. What a weird little player they have. Yumin Lin has been a Cy Young winner in this save. He's had a good year for them. They also have Montgomery. They have Luis Castillo, Joe Musgrove. This is a pretty good team overall, but having to do it without Jordan Lawler is tough. All righty, who's going to win? Diamondbacks take game one. Braves tie up the series. Red Sox take game one. Red Sox take game two. We've got 2-1 over here and 2-0 over here. Ooh, and the Diamondbacks take a 3-1 lead. Meanwhile, Detroit, they add their first win of this series. 2-2 over here, and the Diamondbacks will advance, so it's just down to the American League teams. Red Sox take game five. 
and the Red Sox will advance in six. So this is going to be a Red Sox-Diamondbacks World Series. All right, let's see who can win this one. Diamondbacks take game one. They take game two. Got a rest day. Red Sox, Diamondbacks. All right, this could be the clincher. Diamondbacks in five. Snakes alive. Congratulations to the Arizona Diamondbacks. This is, I believe, their second title. Oh, no, actually their first title uh, so far in this save. So good for them. Snakes alive indeed. Here's a look at your World Series. Yu Min Lin was masterful in his two starts, although the MVP of this series is going to be Jonathan India, who is nothing more than a minor league signing, who wasn't even particularly good for them in the regular season, but he turned it on when it mattered. So I thank you all for watching, and I will see you all in the offseason.